Well, good evening, everyone. My, my name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us is Neil Edward Levin. He is the Senior Nutrition Education Manager for Now Foods and has a really great topic to share with us tonight and has wonderful expertise. Um, and it is on uh, heart health uh, nutrients. Thank you so much, Neil, for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Elizabeth. And I'd like to welcome anyone who's watching this. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is just a slide with my cr credentials and a picture of me from a long time ago, 1974, when I was working at a natural food store in Urbana, Illinois. So. You can see I've been doing this a very long time. So let's talk about heart health in terms of diet, first of all. What's, what are some of the expert opinions, what we should be eating or not eating to have healthy hearts? And this is from the American uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And you can see here where they're saying that we should be eating fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, legumes, and seafoods. So those are considered very desirable, those things here. Uh, alcohol intake should be moderate at, at most. Water, unsweetened tea, and coffee are considered good. And minimized processed meats, refined grains, uh, all these other processed things, added sugar, trans fat, et cetera. Uh, and if there's poor diet quality, that could be a lack of knowledge, a lack of availability, the price of healthy food. Uh, good healthy food might cost more than junk food because it has more nutrients and takes more care to produce. Uh, how much time do people have to prepare or buy or eat? There's social and, court and cultural norms that affect this too. Marketing and branding are huge. Uh, obviously, everyone's seen the commercials aimed at kids for cereal and various things like that. And, and, and taste and flavor. I know people who don't like the taste of whole wheat bread. I don't like the taste of white bread. So people have their own individual uh, preferences in that regard. There's also diet and lifestyle issues that can lead to cardiovascular disease, but also medication that uh, can cause uh, plaque formation or other issues, which require medical interventions. So, you know, this, this is kind of the progression. The food is part of the prevention of keeping healthy. And if people don't have the right nutrients, if they can't keep healthy because they don't have the right inputs, then their risk factors can increase. Now, the American Heart Association has uh, diet and lifestyle recommendations. I collected these yesterday. So you're going to see other experts recommending much the same thing. Eat a lot of produce, fruits and vegetables, whole grains and products, mostly whole grain uh, ingredients. Healthy sources of, of protein, which are typically legumes, nuts, fish, seafood, low-fat, non-fat dairy, and lean, unprocessed meat and poultry. Liquid non-tropical vegetable oils are recommended. Uh, that doesn't mean all the tropical oils are bad for you, but they, they are worried about some of the saturated fats in some of these. Minimally processed foods are recommended, minimal intake of added sugars, uh, little or no salt added, and limited or no alcohol intake. So that's what the American Heart Association thinks we should do. Now, I, I have some issues with some of these. Uh, I know, for example, macadamia nut oil is very healthy. Uh, coconut oil in some diets can be healthy as well, but it's gotta be really minimally processed uh, fats, you know, for example, the virgin coconut oil organic is better than a processed coconut oil, even though they're both food grade. 
Now, when we're looking at the, again, the American Heart Association, uh, this is kind of a summary of what we just saw. This is a scientific statement that they issued. Uh, again, emphasizing fruits, vegetables, whole grains, protein, liquid plant oils, adjust energy intake to achieve and maintain healthy body weight. That means don't consume more calories than you can burn. And follow this guidance regardless of where the food is prepared or consumed, either home, restaurants, anywhere else, same issue. And minimize these things that we mentioned before. Now, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has an Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, the OASH, and they have a shopping list for the heart. Less saturated fats, especially meats and high-fat dairy products. So limit these processed foods, pizza, burgers, creamy sauces, gravy. A lot of that fast food stuff and restaurant stuff tends to be not very healthy. Cut down on the sodium, read your labels. Canned foods are especially, or, or packaged foods are especially high. Get more fiber. That's from fruits and vegetables, beans, and whole grains are your typical sources of fiber. They are from plant materials. You will not get fiber from eating meat or dairy. And that same office recommends the fruits and vegetables. Uh, it's okay to eat fresh, frozen, canned, or dried. The fresh ones, especially tomatoes, cabbage, carrots, are some good examples. Leafy greens and not just head lettuce, iceberg lettuce, but romaine lettuce, spinach, kale, the darker green ones are healthier. Uh, if you get buy canned vegetables, try to get ones that are low in sodium. I, I buy them myself. I see them in the store, so I know they exist. They're not as abundant. They're not as popular, but they, they do exist. Uh, if you get frozen vegetables, try to get ones that are not pre-seasoned with butter or sauces. Broccoli and cauliflower are especially good. Fresh fruits, uh, apples, oranges, bananas, pears, peaches. Oh, and if you're looking for, at canned, frozen, or dried fruit, try to get them with no added sugar or minimal added sugar. And they also have a list of recommended dairy. Fat-free, low-fat. Uh, dairy, uh, especially milk, yogurt, cheese, cottage cheese. Uh, they also recommend soy milk, which has added calcium, vitamin A, and vitamin D to make the nutritional content a little closer to regular cow's milk. And you've heard about whole grains a couple times already. Uh, if whole grain is the first ingredient, whether it's whole wheat or another whole grain, say oats, uh, that is good. If it says 100% whole grain, that's good. I have seen packages in the grocery store that said made with whole wheat. And if you look at the list of ingredients, it's not the first and sometimes not even the second or third ingredients. So they do make whole grain bread, bagels, Muffins, tortillas, uh, breakfast cereals, you can get oatmeal, uh, you can get shredded wheat, even uh, some of the things that are the oat uh, cereals uh, are, could be lower sugar and lower salt. Uh, whole grains like brown or wild rice, quinoa or oats. I love brown rice. I had it for dinner the last two nights for part of my supper, but not everyone likes brown rice. Uh, there is a bias towards white rice, just like there's bias for white bread over whole wheat bread, but it's really a question of taste. Uh, to me, the, the smell of cooked brown rice or cooked whole grain bread uh, or whole grain toast is delicious. That toasted bran aroma and taste you don't get from a white flour product. And you can even get whole wheat or whole grain pasta, couscous, and things like that, although the more common things are white flour. Now, the recommendations for protein, get a variety of foods, fish and shellfish, poultry uh, are recommended, and lean meats in terms of various meat products. For poultry, they recommend chicken or turkey breast, no skin or lean ground chicken or turkey, at least 93% lean. 
And again, the same kind of leanness for lean meats like pork, beef, or ground beef. But ideally, a lot of the protein will come from beans, peas, lentils, and other legumes. Black beans, garbanzo beans. Uh, hummus is a good source, actually. Uh, you know, there's lots of things you can get that are that are bean oriented or legume oriented. Uh, eggs are considered good protein. Unsalted nuts, seeds, nut butters, and tofu are all considered healthy fats in that regard for how for heart health in particular. And another area we have to look at is healthy fats and oils. Replacing saturated fat with healthier unsaturated fats, uh, eating fish, uh, and we're not talking about fish sticks, we're talking about real fish, nuts, seeds, avocados, oils, uh, macadamia nut is high in monounsaturate, so it is, uh, although it's a tropical oil, is actually a healthy oil. Uh, vegetable oils, they recommend canola, corn, olive, peanut, safflower, soybean, or sunflower oil instead of butter. Uh, that's going to be a hard sell for a lot of people. Uh, I'm not a big fan of corn oil, uh, for example. Peanut oil, mostly for deep frying. Uh, safflower oil is okay. High oleic is, is the best there. Soybean oil uh, can be healthy if it's unrefined, but a lot of it is not. And of course, Soybeans, you know, you have to worry about genetically modified soybeans and you have to worry about pesticides with soybeans. Sunflower oils in short supply because of the war in Europe now, which is cutting off a lot of the supplies from Russia and Ukraine, which are the major exporters of sunflower oil. Uh, use low fat or light mayonnaise instead of full fat mayo is their recommendation. Uh, I found that these light ones tend to have artificial sweeteners and things that some people in the natural products uh, uh, consumers might object to. So, you know, that might be something where you would go light on the serving size rather than light on the variety that you're purchasing. Using oil-based salad dressings like balsamic or Italian instead of creamy ones like ranch are considered better. And they, they do avoid, they say avoid coconut and palm oils. Uh, palm and coconut oils are frequently used to make certain other ingredients. For example, palm oil is a source of stearic acid, which is in every fat that there is, every, every natural fat and oil has stearic acid. But one of the highest sources are palm oils, and that's the source of stearic acid, which is used in very tiny amounts as an excipient, as uh, something that's used to help as a processing aid to make certain dietary supplements. So if you see stearic acid on a label, don't be afraid, even if it's from palm oil, because you're not eating a bunch of palm oil you're eating one fatty acid that the body converts to oleic acid. Oleic acid, of course, is omega-9 fatty acid, which is the main fat in olive oil. So eating uh, some of these oils are actually more equivalent to eating olive oil than eating uh, you know, a tropical oil, like, like they say. So like I said, I have some disputes with some of the things they're saying here. They do say, at margarine and other soft spreads may be less saturated fats than butter. If you are getting margarine, make sure it's a natural one, which will normally be made with palm oil, by the way, and uh, which is okay. And watch out that you're not getting trans fats in there. You do not want to see the word hydrogenated on a margarine or any kind of food. That is not a healthy thing to see, to see for any fat if it's hydrogenated. So Harvard Medical School has a public uh, health school, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And this is from their web page. I, I got that there yesterday as well. And they're saying use healthy oils, olive and canola. Actually for heart health, canola oil comes out better in studies than olive oil. And I've had people who are shocked when they hear that. 
some people think canola oil is always genetically modified. It was actually conventionally bred in the 1960s by Canadian uh, agricultural scientists. So it has nothing to do with GMOs and how it was originally produced. But today, a lot of the canola oil, just like a lot of soybean oil, a lot of cottonseed oil uh, is made from GMO crops, which have a lot of pesticides added to them. So, you know, that is a concern if you're getting a non-organic oil and something that might have, uh, you know, be, been genetically modified. So look for a non-GMO if you're getting canola oil. The more veggies, the better variety, the better. And potatoes and French fries are vegetables, but they don't count as a healthy vegetable, uh, especially with what you put on a potato. A potato by itself is not that bad, but when you start putting the salt and, and butter and all the other stuff on there, you can make it unhealthy really fast. Plenty of fruits of all colors are recommended. Uh, again, the water, tea, coffee with little or no sugar. We saw that earlier from another uh, recommendation. Limit your milk and dairy and avoid sugary drinks. Eat whole grains, whether it's bread, pasta, uh, whole grain grains themselves like uh, brown rice. Limit your refined grains, the white rice, white bread, et cetera. And choose good sources of protein. Fish, poultry, beans, nuts, limit red meat, cheese, avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. Now, another area I want to talk about a little bit is about collagen. Uh, a lot of people in the natural products industry, a lot of consumers have heard a lot about collagen lately. There's a lot of collagen products that have come out on the market and a lot of hype about collagen. And I wanted to explain its role in heart health. So collagen are actually protein fibers. They keep our bones and blood vessels strong. They anchor our teeth to our gums. They are needed to repair blood vessels, bruises, and broken bones. And collagen is actually the most abundant protein in the body. There is more protein in collagen than muscle tissue or all the other proteins in the body combined. We need vitamin C and a couple of amino acids, uh, proline and lysine, to form healthy collagen. And there are vitamins and minerals that are catalysts to support the manufacture of proteins. Uh, one example would be uh, ha having uh, the mineral silica is necessary to make collagen. Uh, not only vitamin C, but other antioxidants help support the vitamin C and the collagen as well. <clears throat> so you can see there's, there's a number of inputs. Vitamin B6 is needed for this conversion. So you need a bunch of nutrients. You need to get basically what's in a multivitamin, but you really need more on things like vitamin C and protein. And one reason is because, for example, vitamin C is used up because it's combining with the two amino acids, lysine and proline, to make pro-collagen, to make a substance that converts into collagen. Collagen is made from the pro-collagen, but there are different kinds of collagen there. And I'd like to th thank my friend, Hyla Cass. Uh, I've known for decades, a uh, wonderful woman. And uh, she published this in Nutrition Review some years ago. <clears throat> Now with collagen, there's at least 14 kinds of collagen. Uh, the most common ones you find are types one through four. And, you know, for example, type two collagen you'll get in, from chickens, uh, that, that would be the normal source. Type one and three you'll normally get from beef. So different meats will contain different types of collagen. Now, obviously we don't need to eat meat to get collagen because I've been a vegetarian for 50 years. I have collagen. If you look at grazing animals, they have plenty of collagen. That's where we're getting them from, from cows and things like that, which are making it by eating plants. So you do not have to eat meat to get this protein. You can get it from plant sources. <clears throat> so we can make our own collagen. Now, the types that are most important for the heart are, is type 3 collagen. 
And the type for the blood vessels is type four collagen. So if you see there's a type one and type three collagen in a product that you're buying, you're not getting the type four collagen in there, but you can get that by eating protein. <clears throat> now, one reason this is so important, <clears throat> now Linus Pauling did some research and found that animals that don't make their own vitamin C, uh, if you reduce the vitamin C level in their diet, their collagen production drops and their blood vessels become thinner and weaker. This has actually been duplicated. They take animals that can make vitamin C in the liver and they damage the liver. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't condone this kind of study, but that's the studies they did to validate this. <clears throat> they, they damage the liver so it can't make vitamin C. They block the vitamin C production and animals start making plaque in their bloodstream that never made plaque before. <clears throat> so why is plaque there? Because of weak uh, tissues. That's It's a way to patch them up. So animals can't make their own vitamin C. That's typically guinea pigs they use. It could be uh, fruit eating bats. It could be higher primates. And it, it, also humans fall in that category. There's about 20 species of mammal that cannot make their own vitamin C. And they rely on it from the diet because they have a varied diet and some mutation over the centuries has led to human beings today cannot make their own vitamin C. Some of these other animals with varied diets cannot make their own vitamin C either. But we don't need it because we can recycle it using other substances like antioxidants. So let's look at some of the other supplements that support cardiovascular health and heart health. <laughs> now we, we have a product called Clinical Cardio and I'm gonna use this as an example because you can see it's got a number of ingredients in there. that are active ingredients for blood pressure uh, and cardiovascular support. It has vitamin D, it has L-carnitine and amino acid, it has hawthorn extract, it has grapeseed extract, it has coenzyme Q10 and it has vitamin K in the form of vitamin K2, which is MK7. And so I'm gonna go through each of these ingredients separately, but I'll show you there's other combinations that exist of some of these ingredients as well. Now the clinical cardio six contains Hawthorne and mega natural BP grapeseed extract to support healthy blood pressure already within the normal range. Now, the reason you see this kind of legalistic language on labels is because uh, there's some laws governing what we're allowed to say on dietary supplement labels. And the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994 mandates that companies can only make claims to support already healthy, already normal body structures and functions. So that's what they call a structure function claim. So that's what you will normally see on labels. Uh, you're not really supposed to claim that a product will correct an imbalance, will restore health or anything like that. Those are considered by the FDA to be drug claims. So you see this kind of uh, very legalistic language here on labels that are compliant. I've seen lots of labels that are not, but these are compliant labels, the kind of claims you could see. Supporting healthy blood pressure, keeping it within the normal range. MK7 is a form of vitamin K that helps maintain healthy arterial flexibility. Why is that important? Because if you can imagine the heart beating every second or so, and every time it beats, it sends a pulse of blood into the arteries near the heart. Those arteries literally need to expand with every beat of the heart to let that blood flow come through, that little pulse of blood before it gets distributed out into the blood vessels. And if you have stiff arteries, hardened arteries, arteries with plaque on them, they can't expand and that pulse of blood raises the blood pressure. That dilation of the blood vessels with every pump is supposed to maintain a healthy blood pressure. So you need healthy blood vessels 
to maintain healthy blood vessels, uh, blood pressure. We've got vitamin D to help with calcium metabolism. Uh, once plaque forms in the arteries, it tends to attract calcium. And calcium uh, is supposed to be scavenged by vitamin K and vitamin D to, uh, first of all, the vitamin D is going to bring vitamin, the calcium into the body to help you absorb it. But then vitamin K helps you to transport it from the bloodstream into the bones or other tissues where calcium is needed. If you don't have enough vitamin K and you have plenty of vitamin D, you can actually overload the blood vessels with calcium that has nowhere to go. So you need both the vitamin D to absorb calcium and it does have a role in helping to utilize it, but vitamin K, especially vitamin K2, is needed to help transport that calcium out of the bloodstream and keep that at normal, healthy, safe levels. And MK7 is a form of vitamin K2 that has some unique properties that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this formula also has L-carnitine, another amino acid, and CoQ10 that both support energy production in the heart. And you have to imagine that uh, besides the brain, the heart is the area of the body that uses the most energy. It is constantly going. It's a muscle that is constantly flexing every second or so. So the brain is constantly working. So is the heart. So one of the ingredients in there is hawthorn leaf and flower extract. A lot of people have heard of hawthorn berries. Hawthorn berries is kind of the traditional herb that people used for the heart. And it is a nice source of polyphenols, uh, things that are antioxidant-like compounds. But uh, in terms of cardiovascular health, the leaf and flower extract from the same tree, the hawthorn leaf and flower, uh, is the one that's most effective for the heart. In fact, the German Commission E that has monographs on a lot of botanicals like herbs uh, actually has removed hawthorn berries from their list of medicinal type of herbs with those properties. And they do uh, endorse the hawthorn leaf and flower extract as an effective botanical. And there are studies showing it helps support healthy cardiovascular function. And some formulas will have the berry added to the leaf and flower extract, but make no mistake, the leaf and flower extract is the effective part. And while there are properties and benefits to the berries, it is not nearly as good for the heart as the leaf and flower extract. One reason is this extract has higher free radical scavenging and cardioprotective properties. It helps regulate the blood flow from the heart and oxygen flow and the, the utilization of oxygen by the heart. It makes the heart contraction more effective, stronger, but it also has a vasodilatory action. It also opens up the blood vessels while it's making the heart pump more blood. So that helps to maintain a healthy blood pressure and a healthy, healthy blood flow. The flavonoids in hawthorn leaf and flower extract stabilize the collagen in the blood vessels to maintain their integrity. If the blood vessel collagen starts breaking down, there's not enough support for it. Then you start getting pits and cracks. You, you can visualize it kind of like a highway that has uh, potholes. And what do you do with a highway pothole? You send in a road crew and you patch it with some tar, some sticky tar. It's a temporary fix, but it stops you from breaking your axle by hitting that pothole or, or damaging your tire. Now, in the same way, the body does not want the blood vessels near the heart leaking because that is potentially deadly. So the body is going to compensate by patching that cracked, damaged collagen with a sticky thing like black tar we use in the highways, it's using oxidized cholesterol, which is plaque. So the plaque is there functionally to deal with uh, a lack of support for the collagen in the blood vessels. And the blood vessels are no longer 
dilating and expanding, contracting and staying healthy, all that stress and flex is requires a lot of energy and a lot of nutrients to maintain it. And if you don't have the right energy and nutrients, it will degrade and the body will compensate by producing plaque as, as a mechanism to prevent you from leaking and bleeding to death internally. So it, it's an obvious thing and it's been proven in these animal models, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, a Hawthorne extract also supports cholesterol uh, separation and the flow of bile. So the flow of bile is a way to Bile is actually made out of cholesterol partially. So bile coming from the liver to the gallbladder and from the gallbladder to the digestive tract is a way to help you absorb fats. But it's also a way for the body to dump cholesterol because bile that hits the digestive tract and is encountered by certain substances, fiber, number one, soy protein, number two, plant sterols, number three, will actually carry the cholesterol out of the body. And that's really one of the only mechanisms we have for getting rid of excess cholesterol. And most of the cholesterol in the body is made in the liver due to a perceived need rather than from dietary sources. That's why eggs are now considered healthy even though they have cholesterol. Now, another ingredient in this, which also comes in other, other products, is the Mega Natural BP grapeseed extract. This is a soluble grapeseed extract that has been milled down to a very small size without using nanotechnology to make the polyphenols more absorbable than normal grapeseed extract, so it works at a lower dose. It's a powerful free radical scavenger that helps protect collagen. It also helps with endothelial relaxation. That means the ability of the blood vessel walls to relax. They not only expand and contract, but they tense and relax there. So you're contributing to that normal process and supporting healthy platelet function, which means healthy clotting. Now, this is actually a grape seed that's made from non-fermented wine grapes that are grown in California and processed in California. So we're not talking about a Chinese ingredient. We're not talking about something exotic. This is something that comes from California wine country. It is a really natural solution. I actually take one of the products that has this ingredient in there myself. So this particular grapeseed extract, uh, all grapeseed extracts will do this, but this one does it at a lower dose than normal because of its particle size. It helps maintain blood pressure already within the healthy range. Again, I, I talked about those kind of claims. This is a randomized placebo controlled clinical trial with adults. They took 150 or 300 milligrams of this extract daily for four weeks. And even their already normal blood pressure was significantly lowered after four weeks versus baseline. Even if the blood pressure is within the normal range, it could be a little high for what you want, or it could be maybe someone who has a higher risk factor because of genetics or family history might want to go at the lower end of the range instead of the higher end of the normal range. Now, I mentioned the vitamin K, and this is particularly, there's two kinds of vitamin K, K1, which is what you will get from eating greens and, and grains. And K2, which you will normally get from eating fermented foods. So in the diet, about 90% of the vitamin K is K1 from eating grains, dairy products, those kind of things. And about 10% of the vitamin K in the diet is vitamin K2, which is uh, primarily, as I said, from fermented foods, whether greens or dairy. And it's a regulator of tissue calcification and is critical to maintain arterial elasticity and cardiovascular health. So in healthy women, postmenopausal, 244 women, they took MK7 at 180 micrograms a day or placebo for three years, and they had a significant improvement 
in marker of a arterial stiffness. So it means their arteries uh, were not as stiff as people on placebo. By the way, I take about 600 micrograms of this a day because I'm old. So MK7 is metaquinone 7. The metaquinones are the vitamin K2 forms. And it has unique properties. It helps to prolong osteocalcin and other factors that help build bones to stimulate bone production and bone maintenance. It's also needed to make proteins involved in making bones, cartilage, and artery walls. So vitamin K helps with the actual structures of the bones and the, and the arteries, as well as getting the calcium out of the arteries. Now, this is an interesting chart I ran across some years ago. And it's got the bioavailability of the three forms of vitamin K that are readily available. Vitamin K1 is represented by the area under the curve that's red. So this area that's represented by the this red spike and the area under it is how much you get if you take oral vitamin K1. That's how well it, was, it absorbs. Now, if you're looking at MK4, the green, which is your common source of vitamin K2, that's the area under the curve for the green, which is even smaller. It's maybe half the bioavailability of the K1. Now, when we're looking at the black line, the area under this curve is way, way, way bigger than the area under the red curve or the green curve, this area here. And that's how much more absorption you get by taking MK7 over MK1, I'm sorry, over MK4, your common source of vitamin K2, or taking the regular vitamin K1, which is the normal fine form you'll find in multivitamins, for example. So most multivitamins are going to use vitamin K1. Some of them will use K2 or add vitamin K2, typically as MK4. And uh, we have formulas like that too. Some of the multis I formulated have both K1 and K2 as MK4, but a more exotic, more absorbable form, a more expensive form is the MK7 that has so much better absorption. And it actually works by slowly converting to MK4 in the body. So you actually get more bang for the buck by taking MK7. That's why I take that form for my vitamin K2. There's nothing wrong with MK4 and at low doses, it will absorb okay. But when you're going to high doses, like I'm taking hundreds and hundreds of micrograms, uh, you get more bang for the buck with the MK7 form. And by the way, on labels now, uh, we have vitamin K1, which has a daily value or an RDA listed with the things that have daily values in the top part of a label. Vitamin K2 is now separate on labels because they have not recognized it as an essential nutrient. There is no RDA or daily value for K2. So we used to combine them and add them together for vitamin K levels and daily value levels on a label. But recent change in labeling regulations forces us to move vitamin K2 to the other ingredients so it might be on a multivitamin, dozens of ingredients later on the same label, the vitamin K, K forms are not together on labels anymore, just to warn you. Now, vitamin D I mentioned, and that's in this formula as well. All the cardiovascular cells have vitamin D receptors. The cardiomyocytes, the arterial cell walls, even the immune cells, that are working in the cardiovascular system. Vitamin D has a role that are really essential to cardiovascular function, according to this American Heart Association journal. Vitamin D supports the regulation of calcium levels in the blood and the phosphate levels in the blood, affecting cardiovascular health, and a deficiency can actually increase blood pressure. So that is one of the factors that you have to watch for. 
There is a synergy between vitamins D and vitamin K2. They both are involved in regulating the calcium binding protein in the bone and, and the teeth. Uh, vitamin D regulates the production. Vitamin K is necessary to activate the, this protein. Another nutrient that a lot of you have probably heard of uh, for heart is coenzyme Q10, commonly known as CoQ10. It has a chemical structure kind of similar to vitamin K. It is considered a pseudovitamin, and it's involved in making ATP, which is really an energy molecule that's produced in the body. It's like an energy storage molecule in the body. But it's, CoQ10 is also a free radical scavenger. So because it's involved in energy production and free radical scavenging, the heart needs a lot of CoQ10 more than any other part of the body because of the constant energy use, as well as the exposure to oxygen and free radicals. So there's more concentration of CoQ10 in the heart muscle than anywhere else in the body. And it, according to the Cleveland Heart Lab, uh, part of the Cleveland Clinic, it may have significant cardiovascular protective effects. Now, another nutrient and amino acid is L-carnitine. I actually had some in my smoothie. So L-carnitine, the amino acid, is necessary for energy production. Uh, fats are the main energy source for the muscle in both the skeleton, the skeletal muscle, and the cardiac muscles. About 98% of the carnitine in the body is within those two muscle structures. And it does cross the blood-brain barrier to accumulate in the hypothalamus. So it also has a role in kind of signaling and controlling what's happening with energetics in the body as well. So this is that formula I mentioned that we have, but uh, you can, obviously you can get all these ingredients separately. Since I take higher doses, I tend to take, uh, uh, take them separately. Like the MK7, I'm taking 300 microgram twice a day. For example, I'm doing 200 milligram of the CoQ10 twice a day. Uh, I'm doing the 300 uh, milligram of the grapeseed extract, the mega natural, et cetera. You know, so uh, 5,000 of the D. So, you know, if, if you're taking a moderate range, this is a good formula. Or if you're willing to take uh, a bunch of extra uh, pills, more, more pills than it says here, you can get up to those levels with this kind of formula. I just take them all separately because that's the way I'm used to it. And this is an example. You can get the Hawthorne leaf and flower extract by itself as a 600 milligram per capsule, or you can get it in a 300 milligram that has the Hawthorne berry with it as, as to fill the capsule. Some people like that combination as a traditional combination. Uh, obviously, you're getting twice as strong in the 600 milligram without the Hawthorne berry added. Or the blood pressure health, this is a formula I've used for some years and uh, actually just recommended that to a friend of mine who used it, uh, is very happy with it after just a few days. And you know, someone who's under a lot of stress. And uh, this has the that same mega natural BP grapeseed extract and the Hawthorne extract together in a little bit higher dose without all the other ingredients. Now, another category we look at are the plant sterols to support the health of the cardiovascular system. Uh, Beta-cetosterol is the major plant sterol people are looking at, but camposterol and stigmasterol are a couple of other ones. This formula happens to be in a base of natural fish oil, and we're using a branded plant sterol called CardioAid S. So this is a formula that is providing those plant sterols. Uh, there's over 200 clinical studies on how plant sterols lower cholesterol and both competitive and inhibitory mechanisms. Uh, competitive inhi inhibition of sterol absorption means that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's blocking the reabsorption of bile and cholesterol from the diet. Uh, from absorbing it back into the lip bloodstream going to the liver.
Now, cholesterol will naturally cross from the intestine to the bloodstream uh, by forming micelles, which are little spherical structures. And phytosterols compete with cholesterol for that process. And if it, you have a mixture of micelles containing both cholesterol and phytosterol, they can't be absorbed. So you're blocking cholesterol from absorbing and more is excreted in the stool. And that applies to the bile that's secreted from the liver gallbladder system to absorb fats. Uh, that will be also get absor malabsorbed and blocked and excreted as well as cholesterol in the diet. Now, the consumption of plant sterols uh, between 800 a milligram and, and one gram, uh, a thousand milligram, can significantly reduce LDL cholesterol uh, by about 5%, if it, even if it's within the normal range. And if you double the dosing or triple the dosing, you can actually reduce LDL cholesterol already within the normal range, but you can reduce it by between four and 15% within a month. And the Cleveland Clinic cites an FDA approved health claim on phytosterols like CardioAid that foods containing at least two thirds of a gram, 650 milligram of these vegetable oil plant sterol esters. If you take it twice a day, so you're getting about 1.3 grams uh, with a meal as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol can reduce or may reduce the risk of heart disease. So Cleveland Clinic points out that there is an FDA approved health claim on these phytosterol type products. Another product that was popular a number of years ago is still uh, fairly popular uh, are the polycosinols from sugarcane. And this is based on a bunch of Cuban studies. And when they tried duplicating it with polycosinols from other sources, they did not work the same way. The polycosinol, which means it contains uh, these, poly means multi. So there's different cosinols. You might have heard of octocosinol, which is from wheat, wheat germ oil, for example. So this contains a number of them and actually, uh, the octocosinol is, which is number eight cosinol is what it stands for, is one of the main ones. So this also is fortified with artichoke extract, milk thistle extract, alpha lipoic acid, and grapeseed extract. So you're supporting the role of polycosinol on cholesterol levels within the normal range with other herbal things and, and alpha lipoic acid that will help with liver function and uh, that whole process as well. So it's a mixture of compounds isolated from sugarcane wax. Uh, like I said, that beeswax, rice, and wheat germ also contain polycosinols, but they're different combination. It doesn't work quite the same way. And again, there's the, here's your octocosinol, which uh, is an old school nutrient people took wheat germ oil for. A meta-analysis uh, of 22 published studies said that this form of polycosinol significantly affected total cholesterol, LDL and HDL cholesterol, and supported the, the studies support the, both the benefits and safety of polycosinol versus placebo. Now, Cholesterol Pro is an interesting product because we, we've combined a plant, a French plant sterile combination with an Italian citrus extract. And the, some of these citrus extracts have shown some very good studies on their own. Uh, they've both demonstrated ability to support serum lipid levels, cholesterol levels, et cetera, that are within the healthy range. But the citrus bergamante and the phytopin, which is a, a pine-derived French plant sterile combination are in this product. Uh, I take this product myself too, by the way. So it's got the pine phytosterols. You can get other sources as well, but this one does uh, have studies showing it works. Now the bergamante is 
extracted from bergamot fruit, that's the same fruit they use to make Earl Grey tea, for example, is the citrus flavoring agent. And it contains these bioflavonoids like naringin, uh, which is you might have heard of if, if you're into these kind of things, supporting healthy cholesterol metabolism, free radical scavenging. And as a side effect, it might actually help maintain healthy blood sugar levels. Now, the cholesterol pro, pro in this study, 59 patients with metabolic syndrome, which are risk factors for high blood pressure, high blood sugar, et cetera, uh, versus placebo, there were significant benefits, which these stars indicate, these asterisks, uh, significant results on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and blood glucose taking 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day of the bergamot extract for about a month. And this kind of shows it too, the effect over the month of on total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol was fairly steady, but the other ones which are considered undesirable in higher levels, uh, actually reduced within the normal range. Now, coenzyme Q10 I mentioned earlier, but there's another form called CoQ8 or ubiquinol that we want to mention. Uh, I, I did discuss earlier that it's important for the heart muscle and its concentration is higher in the heart. It has redox cycling. It converts from oxidative to antioxidant form. And its oxidation in the body is actually part of the ATP synthesis, part of the ability of CoQ10 to act kind of like a spark plug to stimulate the production of this energy storage molecule ATP in the body. So these are the ubiquinone, the, it's, a, it's the oxidized versus reduced form of CoQ10. This is your common form of CoQ10. If you just see CoQ10, it's ubiquinone. Ubiquinol, a, a very specialized form of CoQ10, will always be declared on the label. And you can see there's a variety of these. And they have uh, other ingredients in them as well. This 200 milligrams, the one I use twice a day. This chewable is the one my wife takes. So you can see, you know, we're going for the high levels. Uh, the higher levels you have to put in soft gels because they just don't flow into a capsule nicely. They, they won't fit this much into a dry capsule. And for example, here's the 100 milligram that is, we fill the capsule with hawthorne berry instead of using starch for some synergism. And we have three different uh, offerings for ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is also known as CoQH, CF. CF stands for crystal free. And this is a trademarked ingredient, ubiquinol. It's only manufactured by one Japanese supplier in Texas, by the way. So it's made in the USA. And it has some different properties from the regular CoQ10. It's a specialized form of CoQ10 known as CoQH, but it's, it's an active form of CoQ10. And uh, ubiquinol is always sold in a liquid form dissolved in a solvent such as MCT oil or something else like that that carries it and increases the absorption. So ubiquinol absorbs better because of its built-in delivery system in the liquid. Now we have a liquid CoQ10 that also has some vitamin E and some soy lecithin in there. And it's a uh, fructose sweetened, sorbitol sweetened, uh, orange flavor. This actually tastes really good when we demo it. So it's another way to get CoQ10. And we also have to look at fatty acids for cardiovascular health. The FDA has a qualified health claim you can use on labels that says there is evidence that consumption of EPA and DHA, the omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil, may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. You can also get EPA and DHA from algae nowadays. 
So we have CoQ10 in a base of fish oil. So you can get uh, 250 milligrams of fish oil along with 60 milligrams of CoQ10 and 200 milligrams of soy lecithin. Soy lecithin is really good for the heart. I actually add lecithin to my smoothies as well. Uh, it does tend to have a moderating effect on LDL cholesterol. Red Omega, we've combined the fish oil with organic red yeast rice and CoQ10 for a combination. And the cardiovascular support uh, claim is primarily from the omega-3 and the CoQ10. Now, red yeast rice is a fermented rice. Uh, it's rice fermented with a red yeast, with a live yeast that is produced to avoid the pre presence of a toxin called citronin. And so uh, it's something that is often used as part of a cardiovascular health program as a supporting food. It's actually a food. And uh, we also have krill oil. And this is a combination of krill oil with CoQ10. Krill oil is interesting too. Uh, krill oil has omega-3 fatty acids that are better absorbed. And it has non-soy phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine. And it has a form of astaxanthin, which is the pigment that is in flamingos. It's the pigment that's in uh, uh, various plants. It's, it's kind of a pinkish red pigment. Uh, salmon have astaxanthin, that color. And this is a study of the Neptune krill oil, which is the kind we carry. And it shows that take the change in EPA and DHA concentrations in the bloodstream and in, in the plasma actually increase more by taking krill oil than the fish oil. So krill oil can help with joint comfort, healthy blood lipid levels, and even reduce symptoms of PMS but also helps to safeguard the skin against sun damage. And the krill oil monograph in the uh, Alternative Medicine Review uh, journal, scientific journal, shows that total cholesterol improves better with krill oil than fish oil, that triglycerides improve better, that LDL cholesterol improves better, that HDL cholesterol improves better, and blood glucose, blood sugar improves more. Taking a lower dose of krill oil, taking half or a third as much krill oil worked better than the fish oil. And lastly, there's a few other supplements. Pantothene, I take pantothene every day too because it is uh, something that can help increase the HDL, the good cholesterol. So this shows a bioavailability study we did with our product on adult volunteers. It's the active coenzyme form of pantothenic acid, vitamin B5, which is a precursor of coenzyme A, which is needed for fat, carb, and protein metabolism, and also for fatty acid production in the body. The non-essential fatty acids that you can actually make in the body need this nutrient to do that. Pantothene also supports the adrenal gland against stress. There is more pantothene in the adrenal gland and more vitamin C in the adrenal gland than anywhere else because they help fight stress. But pantothene also helps with cholesterol production and fat storage, healthy body fat distribution, maintaining healthy serum lipid levels, and supporting cardiovascular system. Uh, oral pantothene can slightly lower triglycerides, total cholesterol, and LDL while raising HDL. Uh, niacin tends to do that too, by the way, in higher doses. And we have a product called Vein Supreme, which is based on the Trunarin, a trademark ingredient based on prickly ash bark extract. We've added horse chestnut, butcher's broom, grapeseed extract, and rootin powder. I really like root and powder. I, we get lots of good reports for that. Trunarin, uh, with all these ingredients, helps to support vascular tone and integrity. In other words, blood vessel integrity. 
It affects arterial blood pressure, working on nicotinic receptors, working on the niacin receptors, and releasing acetylcholine as a vasodilator without affecting the heart rate. So it has effects on blood pressure and platelet activity. Butcher's broom and horse chestnut both contain a compound called estin, which affects the tone of veins and the vascular permeability, the ability of things to move in and out of the uh, blood vessels appropriately. And uh, lastly, we have natokinase, an enzyme that is produced in a fermented soy product, uh, which helps with maintaining healthy blood flow because it helps to dissolve the fibrin, a material that helps form clots. So it helps maintain normal blood fluidity and circulation. So it's a protein uh, produced by the liver that helps blood clots to form. And this enzyme is what helps control it to normal levels in the body. So with that, we're gonna conclude this very interesting session, unusually interesting session. Uh, and we discussed how supplements can affect heart health. So I'm going to turn this back to Elizabeth to moderate. Thank you, everyone. Okay, perfect. I did put that. So um, there is um, a sale on some of the items mentioned by our wonderful presenter tonight, Neil Levin. Which is always an honor. Yeah, it's always an honor to work with you, Neil. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, so there's, um, I can't remember if it's 25% off or um, those sale items. It's a it's a, a good deep discount from what I uh, tried to do the math. Okay, so Marlene's is discounting heart health products from now. Which is um, on sale now until <laughs> <laughs> until the end of the month. So uh, go to either store location and our wonderful staff in our supplements department can help you out with that. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here.